Well, hello there. Welcome back <clears throat> to our final module in Church History 2, Church Since the uh, Pre-Reformation and the Reformation. We're excited that you've come this far, and uh, we're, we're going to do a, a little overview of the course and what I think is the main theme. You'll find that your reading has some interesting insights about where the church is headed and, and what uh, modern trends might be affecting things going forward, but ultimately uh, history is is unknown until it plays out. Not, of course, unknown to the Lord, but certainly unknown to uh, to us. So hopefully you've got your, you've done your reading or you're ready to do your reading and uh, take part in this great adventure. We're going to look through all of these. We're going to go through the early Reformation uh, and the Reformation and the Ca Ca Catholic Reformation, the missions and revivals, rationalism and Russians, revolt and revolution, revivalism and rise of secularism, ideology and experiment experientialism, uh, modern movements, and church history in the future. And I think we're going to come to an exciting conclusion having to do with this. Church history <coughs> is in so many ways uh, inexorably, of course, uh, tied to the Bible, tied to the Word of God. And I've tried to make the argument uh, going throughout this course, and hopefully you've taken uh, heed of it, uh, that the function of our development and growth in church history is our function in moving closer to what the Word of God reveals. And as we've seen, each uh, phase, each step as we that we've taken in church history uh, affirms the importance and the need of the Bible and as our unifying force. Now, uh, we could be more simplistic and certainly not correct or not incorrect by pointing out that our, our true focus, our, our, our um, you know, source of unity is Christ and the salvation which he offered on the cross. But even that we know from the word of God. That's not, uh, you know, spiritually discerned or obtained. That's we know what we know about the Lord through what he's revealed to us in the word of God. So <clears throat> as you think about this large overarching story that the Lord is telling in his church over the last 2000 years, uh, I think you can make a very strong and meaningful argument that it has been our ability, by, led by the Holy Spirit and by the people whom he's moved, to come to understand what it means to live uh, as biblically as possible, right? And what that means in terms of the social movements and the various forces that come against the church and the like, uh, ultimately we'll find that the Word of God is, is the uh, standard and the most powerful force. It truly is the sword of the Lord in this regard. So, as we go to the pre-Reformation, right, we're looking at time that uh, that occurred some, you know, the Renaissance is probably the best way to describe it because that's when it happened and, and what it was. And it's that Renaissance that came about because the explosion of art and literature and specifically things like printing that made it possible for the Word of God to not just be translated and, and be made available to the people, uh, but also to be publicized and brought, published all over the world. Uh, Europe and then the world. So the pre-Reformation was uh, saw our John Wycliffe's and our Jan Hus's and, and these types of characters who were so important in bringing the Word of God to the people. And it was bringing the Word of God to the people that really led to the Reformation, right? The Reformation came as people became more uh, familiar with and had access to the Word of God, much to the fear of uh, the Catholic Church and, and the estate, that establishment, because they didn't want to share that power. They knew if everybody had the Word of God that, one, they might come up with uh, bad or wrong or heretical conclusions. We've seen that has been the case, right? Certainly we can say that the there have been various cults, problems, and still, you know, cults and problems around rising through irresponsible or misinterpretation based upon usually, again, political, personal aims and goals of, for wealth, power, and the like. Sometimes just a, uh, a well-meaning nut job, but for the most part, uh, people who are, are um, trying to manipulate or control, right? So uh, certainly those fears were not unfounded, but the greater advantage of it certainly outweighed all of the threats and the costs. As people had access to the Word of God, you get your, you know, your Luthers and your Calvins and your scholars who rise up, as well as those who followed them and were instructed by them, 
you know, the Anabaptists, Anabaptists, and, and again, it's not to say that there weren't errors made along the way. In fact, as we look through the Reformation, we saw that most of those early Reformers, and even the Reform uh, going into the Reformation, even into today, you know, really accepted everything that they didn't expressly reject from the Catholic Church. So it wasn't a movement necessarily of going back constantly to the Word of God to check everything against the Word of God. Uh, they were, by and large, willing to accept many things, and that's what made the Anabaptists so um, revolutionary at the time is that they were willing to make <clears throat> greater leaps and bounds uh, than anyone else in terms of coming to ask that question, what does the Word of God say? What does the Bible have to say about the matter? So this movement away from human institutions and towards the direct authority of the Lord to govern his church uh, wasn't fully developed, but began to be developed in this Reformation period. And as the word became available, that's uh, what we could argue what the, the Holy Spirit used to to bring that forth, to combat tyranny and oppression, and to bring people into that individual private relationship with Jesus Christ, with God, through Christ's sacrifice, right, through the gospel. So, we uh, have to note that the Reformation was a powerful and important turning point in church history because it really recentered us on the idea, at least, that the Word of God, Sola Scriptura, was the uh, source of authority in, in the church and in our lives. As we saw, as we go, went through the Counter-Reformation, and we, we don't want to call it the Catholic Reformation because it really wasn't a Reformation of the Catholic form. They weren't reforming anything. They only solidified things that they already believed in those central authority structures, and, um, you know, they disdained uh, salvation by faith alone through grace alone, as Scripture reveals and, and clearly states, and instead opted for a, no, the church still dispenses salvation model, right? The church dispenses salvation through faith and works, and, and that uh, pushed forward this uh, concept, again, that kept the institutional church at the center of um, the, the, the salvation experience or someone's relationship with God. So uh, we think of this time as being a pushback against the Word of God. Again, this is the centerpiece of this whole kind of church history story that's being told. It's how the Word of God became available and hopefully better and better understood by the church in order to bring about a, a, a more mature church along the lines that God truly desired or wanted. And of course, we're still in that process. We went through the period of missions and revivals, and the church uh, continually finds herself when she's lost in the need to share the message with others. I believe the Lord brings about uh, tension and discontent and problems, just as he did in the book of Acts by allowing the uh, the great persecution in Jerusalem to, to cause a diaspora across all of you know the ancient world as the early Christian church, mostly Jewish, would spread around and bring the message, right? So there's this sort of um, continuing theme theme that started in the book of Acts, and really we could argue goes uh, further back into the Old Testament with the Lord's diaspora of Israel, and he uses the that diaspora, to that spreading of people to spread his message. And we realize that part of our major function here is Matthew 28, 19, 20 says, is to go therefore and make disciples. And our, 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 our mission to bring the gospel um, to the world is often, as we'll see again in church history after this, a point of um, distinct unification and important work of the church. Then we looked at the issue of rationalism, and uh, rationalism began, interestingly, within the safe cubby of a biblical Christian worldview. Um, this idea that you know, rationality or just pure reason apart from, or really at this, not, not at this point fully, but uh, moving away from the idea that all of these things that wisdom and knowledge are based upon or built on come from the fear of the Lord. So <clears throat> this idea that maybe we can just have that rationalism, that reason, and, you know, work with the physical world uh, began to bud and spread. But we want to note yet again that these concepts, these convictions come from a biblical worldview. The reason why reason can be trusted is that we were created in the image of a reasonable God. In fact, the creator of all reason, if we want to get really meta about it, we could say that God um, created, invented wisdom before he invented the earth, as he tells us in the book, early chapters of the book of Proverbs. 
So the reason why you can trust your reason is that God gave us reason, and he is reasonable. However, if we move away from that concept and say, well, let's just make reason our God and make uh, you know, our own rationality our God, then we lose all of the presuppositions needed to make rationalism rational or, or rationalism reasonable, if you like. That's a major point of loss. And as the West continued to careen in this way, away from the underpinnings, the intellectual, philosophical, and theological underpinnings, it became more and more irrational in its rationalism. That led to a kickback of revivalism, right? As people saw how empty that was, uh, generally we started to see revivals uh, jumping up and moving up uh, throughout the world, right? In the 1800s and and, and following this, this time in which people were returning to a, a, a response to God and returning to the Bible as the guide and the you know, sacrifice of Christ as the central and important feature in our relationship with God. So this revivalism was a wonderful response to that, uh, that rationalism that was kind of creeping up against the needed revelation and, again, philosophical underpinnings provided by God's Word and by Christianity. As we move forward, we see the rise of secularism continue to push back, right? And so we notice that the, the, world, of, or the, the world of church history, if you want to call it that, is not in any way a simple story, right? It's all the humans uh, shuffling around and uh, coming to their own conclusions, if you like. And so this idea of secularism continued to push forward, again, in the non-believing world. This, And even within the believing world of the liberalizing Christianity, the thought that maybe if we just set aside all of our theological convictions and so forth, that we're going to wind up with a nice, peaceful, secular world where everyone just deals with the time, space, and matter available to them. And it all comes out great. This turned out not to be the case, of course, but we notice that it is a persistent worldview perspective that has not left the world. In fact, we could argue that these uh, seeds that were planted have come to full fruition in, in the modern age. And secularism affects churches as well as, um, you know, governments and societies. The idea that by just ignoring those important issues of faith and the spiritual reality and the philosophy of behind, but we just focus on the physical world and um, this, this idea of a non-religious worldview is, of course, an absolute fantasy because you always have theological or spiritual or moral convictions that you're building on something besides just the uh, workaday secular world. And uh, to not deal with those or to claim somehow that yours are objective because they're not rooted in this system, but they're rather rooted in your own uh, system or a secular uh, materialistic system, were, have proven to be wholly ineffective because then you get the people who, uh, who are doing that and, and we become the ultimate standard and arbiter, which means when my standard differs from yours, what's left to do? Well, what happened in the modern world amongst the atheist and secular sports is just a lot of, lot of killing, a lot of killing, which led to the ideology and experiment, experientialism age. Um, that ideology uh, put forth secular replacements for religion. These were uh, essentially theological convictions um, and, and religious convictions in the deepest sense of the word, and yet they were religious convictions against Christianity and against you know, uh, the, the spiritual reality, um, such as communism, nationalism, and individualism, right? Those are the three words we want you to remember from that. Communism uh, suggested, and really in some sense, communism and nationalism both, suggested that the state was the answer, that it's this human government that is going to straighten everything out, and everything must ultimately be uh, committed to the state, the state whoever those, that ruling authority is, and a huge problem with having to decide who gets to do that, right? Uh, apart from the uh, biblical revelation surrounding the institution of government at the Noahic Covenant. And uh, without that realization, the rulers are in every sense um, subject to God or stewards of God. That's not their self-generated authority, but rather it is their God-given authority to take care of God's people, or take care of the people. So these ideologies, these secular ideologies, now sought to replace, and, and they very much have in many people's lives. Uh, if you see 
people who are communists or nationalists, you find they have little or no use for God unless God somehow uh, can support or, or some Christian, you know, perversion of scripture can, can be used to support their um, ideology, right? The ideology becomes the major conviction and or, and belief, and then everything else is useful or useless, true or false in their viewpoint, based upon whether or not it supports their thinking on that regard. It's a major misstep in, in human history, but of course, it makes perfect sense with the rising rebellion against God and his word and what he reveals. So, um, we saw communism as the idea that the state will be able to collect everything, everybody will work and will distribute everything equally, and everybody stands, you know, completely shoulder to shoulder and as, as equals. But as uh, George Orwell pointed out in these uh, tyrannic and oppressive atheistic systems, uh, that there are always some animals more equal than others, right? As, as uh, Animal Farm's great expression goes. Uh, the idea that ultimately, well, it might have uh, altruistic um, commitments, it involves two things that are impossible. One is that the human nature of greed or laziness or selfishness will uh, always prevail as the abiding reality of a sinful man. And that is perpetuated and made far worse by the second conviction is that uh, faith in God and specifically the faith of Christianity will be uh, exposed or um, expunged from that society. So now you have a uh, society that is based upon the need for everybody to be good and the reality that everybody is not good because of the effects of sin. And then you've removed the only uh, remedy for that sin by removing faith in Christ. This is a core contradiction of ability in the system to provide anything of meaning. And even if you were to try to generate some sort of a Christian communism, we have the same problem, which is that uh, ultimately Christianity is not meant to work as a forced faith. It is meant to work as individual people responding to the call and the grace of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit in order to uh, sur surrender in the sense of trusting in his sacrifice for our sin and uh, subjugating our will to his will, which is revealed, you got it, in the Bible. So this uh, age of ideology, uh, you know, in communism proves to be again and again an abysmal failure that it results in incredible amounts of death and oppression everywhere it's attempted. Nationalism is little better or, or no better because it also suggests that perhaps it is the commitment to the individual state and the individual states, you know, the fatherland, the motherland, which of course is... Uh, difficult a little bit for us to understand it from the American perspective because we don't have a nation in the sense that all other historical nations have had nations, right? Uh, mostly the nations of, you know, call it Germany, France, China, Korea, whatever it is, were peopled by a single family group or, um, you know, people with very great um, uh, bi uh, biological similarity as well as language and history and cultural similarity and so and usually uh, uh, attachment to a specific kind of part of land piece of land and so it made sense in those contexts you know germany france england whatever uh, to to look back on their history and say we are a nation and we need to advocate for our nation just as a, a, a husband and a wife or a mother and a father advocate for their family so you know this people group and this language group and this with all their you know relationship to their land and their philosophical convictions and the like you know culture and, and the like is what is going to be the salvation right but the truth of the matter is far from that uh, while the lord certainly defined nations and gave us the idea of nations at the table of nations in genesis 10 and 11 we see this picture of uh, that being a stopgap, not a ultimate cure, right? Um, and while we should hope to preserve individual nations as long as possible, because that's what stops, you know, standing in the way of the rise of the one world government, the Antichrist, it is not the dedication to those nations as the would-be savior. And of course, even in America, where our, our nationalism differs quite significantly, right? Because anyone who comes to, um, comes to America is and can be, in some sense, made to be American, right? Whether you have to immigrate or, you know, I'm not trying to get into controversial issues on that end at all. But the point being that, you know, most Americans today were of, you know, some other, uh, some other 
continent's descent or some other nation's descent. So it is um, a different type of, of nation and commitment, and yet that has not stopped people from, and, and again, on, on both sides, but very particularly uh, toward, on, on a certain side of the political spectrum, to try to make the nation the tool by which all good happens. And so you get people who are nationally committed, they're Americans, and then secondarily committed to Christianity because they view that as part of the national American way of life, uh, which might have some historical argument for it, but isn't biblically a valid way to think. Believers are citizens of heaven and are meant to think of themselves as citizens of heaven and be the best earthly citizens that we can be to whatever nation you happen to be affiliated with. But ultimately, our spiritual conviction needs to override and take precedence over our national or political convictions. Um, And that's been a huge stumbling stone for the church. It's been a huge challenge for the church to try to find uh, meaning or purpose or the, you know, uh, finality of solutions to problems that only Christ can solve through the interworkings of the nation, through the laws of that nation or through the uh, political aspirations, workings of that nation and the like. And we see that simply never going to be the case, that our focus as Christians uh, must be on the Word of God, the Son of God, and the, the gospel in order for us to move forward. I'm not suggesting that we be politically inactive. Again, we're meant to be uh, good citizens of our nation, and we're meant to be salt and light uh, in, in, in the sense of being a positive impact on our culture. But this ideology also is deeply uh infecting the church and it's gangrenous it's it's truly destructive to church history because again it divides our loyalties and as the lord said you cannot serve two masters and so the final ideology that was mentioned here was individualism and this is again very close to us in the uh, in the west and i would argue even more pronounced in the uh, american context and that is the idea that the most important thing is the individual, the individual's will, the individual's freedom, and so on and so forth. So, um, and and we see this right as well uh, affecting and infecting the church. This individualism, this nobody tells me what to do. You know, I've got ultimate freedom, maximum freedom to to do whatever I please, uh, without any other forces acting upon me or overseeing me, is a, a very difficult thing to deal with from the Christian perspective. Because there is a, an element, a very significant element of individuality built into every man by God. And that individuality is also expressed through the fact that groups of people cannot trust in Christ. Only individuals uh, by themselves can trust in Jesus, right? It's something that a decision everyone, it is a decision that everyone needs to make on an individual basis, which again is where this idea kind of can draw forth from some biblical uh, standings and background is that ultimately we can affect groups of people through violence or through pressure or whatever it is, through persuasion. But the important thing for Christianity or from the faith of the Bible is that every single person comes to trust Christ, an opportunity to be faced with the reality of their need for salvation in Christ. This gets taken to its uh, unhealthy extreme when people suggest, as many do in today's world, that their faith is somehow an individualized uh, thing alone, rather than recognizing that when you trust in Christ, you become a part of this church family, and you're meant to associate with a local church. We are meant to be a part of uh, groups and bodies and association through the working of Jesus Christ uh, with the with the church, and so uh, tragically, in many again Western contexts, there's sort of a this is my faith. It's individualized. It's not an us thing. It's all a me thing. It's all about what the Lord's doing with me. So I may as well just go fishing rather than be in church because that's where I talk to God, and that's what it's about is me talking to God. But that's not what it's about. It isn't just about that. It is about you growing with Christ, and it's also about you encouraging others to grow in Christ, and it's about you, uh, you know, advancing advancing towards the Lord and growing in your faith uh, through the uh, teaching and instruction that comes through the Word, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, through the interaction with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So those three ideologies of communism, nationalism, and individualism, as secularized and godless as they are, caused massive amounts of damage, both, in, of course, in the secular world, where those ideologies continue to cause great damage, but also in the church, where people have taken man, man's philosophy, human ideas, and tried to either syncretize them or uh, even really uh, replace 
Christian theology with those ideologies, and um, it's been greatly destructive. We also saw in this period a rise in uh, experientialism. The idea of building off of that sort of existential kind of presets that all I know is my little experience and that's all that I can tell and therefore uh, what I experience is the most important delineator of truth if you'd like to call it that so um, the the only thing that I can know is that you know I I I fear death that death is ahead for me and I don't know how to deal with that and so uh, some sort of experience and this is where um, Kierkegaard comes in and suggests that really trusting Christ coming to to the faith is about a leap of faith right and this is the the thought that there is reason beyond reason and that you must uh, just hope out and step off step off of the cliff right like in indiana jones when he had to step out in faith and found out there was an invisible or an unseeable bridge there an unperceivable bridge from that perspective i guess but um but this idea that somehow and this still gets perpetuated in the church today uh that we just want to rush people to you know just take that leap of just try a little bit of jesus just try just try just try and see if you like it see if it works see if the power is there whatever it is uh, versus the biblical affirmation that the faith of the bible is not just reasonable it's most reasonable because it is built upon the reality of <laughs> that God has created and he's revealed to us how he wants us to interact with it. So belief in God is not an unreasonable belief. It is the most reasonable belief. It is unreasonable to think that things just created themselves in order and wisdom and all of the love and, uh, you know, the, the complex creatures and systems just popped into existence. That's, that's unreasonable, right? That is not a reasonable conviction. But the reality that there is a God who's constantly, uh, who created all this and is constantly interacting with and guiding and leading and teaching, and, and again, largely through, uh, through his word, uh, making himself known to us is a uh, different perspective altogether. Well, this experientialism led to a sort of Christianity that was guided by my experience with God, and that led to various other um, expressions of experientialism in the church. God isn't some uh, 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 another personality, a being that created us, right, that, that we can know and interact with. Rather, it is a series of mountaintop experiences or of supernatural experiences, such as, you know, the perception that, that there's been, you know, tongues or healings or whatever it is, and b- building your faith on whether that was a powerful uh, emotional meeting or a uh, perception that some mirac- something miraculous had happened or whatever it is, that the these things you experienced were the things that uh, were the bedrock and the foundation of a healthy uh, walk with God, which is not the case. Again, uh, we will all experience things, and our experience is not without meaning, importance, and value. But my experience does not necessarily correlate with truth. More to the point, my perception or interpretation of my experience doesn't necessarily correlate to the truth. We know as humans, we can be disconnected from reality, become absolutely mad. And the word of God is what reveals that reality to us so that we can be rightly connected to it. Do you see how I'm continuing to make this argument and understanding that all the attacks on Christianity come as ultimately attacks on whether or not we can or how we're meant to rightly relate to the word of God. So we moved into modern movements. We talked about neo-orthodoxy and various ways to try to compromise with the secular uh, convictions, right? So the secular convictions come out that, you know, that they believe in uh, such things as evolution or billions and billions of years, which is just the necessary invention that they need to make the impossible possible, even though it doesn't matter how long you wait, impossible is still impossible. Abiogenesis or life from non-life is impossible. It's unreasonable. It's absurd uh, to to even think of it. And yet, because they were making those convictions with such um, so, such fortitude, and it's because they were ultimately brainwashed and brainwashing, they were seeking to o- uh, omit the truth in order to brainwash people to enforce people to accept these materialistic lies and this materialistic worldview. And so much of the church thought, well, all of these smart people are coming up with all of this, uh, you know, this 
evidence that they perceived or were misinterpreting to present a secularized worldview. And much of the church tragically compromised and said, well, maybe just, well, they must be, right. oh, well, I'll accept, and moved away from the word of God, the, the, the revealed truth from God. And so we saw the modern movements in uh, missions, and we saw the modern movements in denominationalism, which had crept up, of course, before as a result of not dealing with our, uh, our our differences and understanding the word of God and our desire in a in a patient and godly way, but rather sort of a, well, you disagree with me? Okay, then I'm going to go over here and make another church. Well, you disagree with him? Okay, well, we're going to go over here and make another church, right? Um, this context and concept of how we understand and how we corporately are growing to understand the word of God really is at the center of it and uh, in, the, in regards to um, ultimately every... You know, church that we could call orthodox has a conviction that the Bible is the word of God, that it's trustworthy, that it's reliable, it's sharper than two -ed any two-edged sword and the like. So as we compare modern movements, we're meant to compare them to the word of God. We're meant to compare them to what does the Bible say? Where am I wrong about the word of God? And how can I come to a better, more clear understanding? And uh, we've seen marvelous advances in the study of hermeneutics or how we study, how we understand the Bible. When God reveals something, is every single command meant for every single person on the earth? Well, we say, of course not, because there are various commands that are very localized in their uh, in their um, nature and their scope, right? Joshua was told to go take the city of Jericho and in, in the promised land, and no believer since then has been commanded in that way to to take the promised land, right? The, the land of Israel. And, and how do we understand the distinction between God's promises and dealings with Israel, a national uh, physical people, right? The seed of Abraham, a family of people, uh, which he used to uh, reveal himself, reveal his plan, and ultimately to bring forth Jesus Christ, the Messiah. How does that relate to this new gathering of people that are not a uh, physical nation born, you're not born into the church, right? In fact, every individual from every tongue and tribe and nation becomes a part of the church by spiritually being placed into Christ at the moment they trust in him. So we see that this um, tension still continues because there are many who don't understand the basic rules of how we read and understand a document. When God says to Ezekiel, go over there and you know, tell those people uh, my message or their blood's on your head. Is that something that's for everybody? Well, no, of course not. That's, uh, that was Ezekiel's mission. That was God's design for Ezekiel. Now, can we draw indirect applications from that? Absolutely. God's love and care for the lost, the, the value and important urgency of any mission. But we can't appropriate things that, you know, everything that Jesus said to the Jewish people or, or even to the disciples in the context of his earthly ministry and then just port that over to today's uh, revelation. In fact, it shows us that we have the uh, letters, the epistles, section of the Bible in the book of Acts, which kind of gives us that bridge and understanding of it, shows us exactly how we are uh, meant to apply this gospel, this new uh, body of, to this new body of people, this groupings of people is, uh, organized into local churches that are ruled by elders, that are independent, and all dedicated to his gospel and to the pro proclamation of his word and growth. So we saw how these most modern movements uh, in, in Christianity and, and in missions were sometimes very productive and sometimes less productive, but all based upon their connection to and their application of the word of God. And so that brings us to the final question of our short final lecture is, what do we make of the Bible? There's an interesting final chapter in your textbook that tries to uh, make sense to some degree of the various movements that we see now. But as I said, we won't really be settled in understanding what's going on for, should the Lord tarry another 20, 30, 40, 50 years or even more to really understand what the impacts of the, the working of the church and the Lord's direction there was. However, Based upon this survey of church history, I think we can make a positive statement that wherever we're headed, the Word of God is what directs us aright. If we make of the Bible 
what the Lord has uh, has designed for us to make of the Bible, that it is his word, his revelation, his standard, his desire, it contains and reveals his will to us, then we will move forward in a productive way. And that's precisely what we see as we look at church history at any given point, whether it's at the Reformation where the Catholic Church said, no, it's not the Bible, it's the Bible plus our tradition, and the Reformers who are at least trending towards the idea that, no, it's the Bible, it's, the, it's only the Bible, or towards the... Uh, uh, various times of the Enlightenment or, or, or secularization, wherein various Christians say, well, maybe it's the Bible plus our philosophy, plus our ideology, and then they fade off. They fall off into uh, nothingness, right? They become, uh, just kind of spiral off into that, uh, into becoming secularists, more or less, right? The, the, those movements and those teachers and those individuals that may maintain a commitment and dedication to growing in the understanding of the Word of God are the ones that will push forward in this great story. Uh, those who seek to compromise or um, betray the Word of God by uh, subjugating it to other authorities, whether that's internally within ourselves or externally within some other uh, philosophical discipline, or conviction, will find that those things fade away into uselessness and ultimately just become a part of that which opposes the Lord in the, in the long term, opposing the gospel, opposing the truth of the word, opposing the church of God and the like. Whether that's, again, like the various cults that we jumped up that jumped up the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, that added new authority sources in order to distract from especially the most important parts of the word in order to cause some sort of uh, political entity or social or financial entity that could exercise more power, right? We see that those uh, things all move away from this. And there's a wonderful book by... Um, Charles Lindell, I think is, is his name, called The Battle for the Bible that was written in the previous generation. And he points out that every generation fights a battle for the Bible afresh. Every generation fights a battle as to whether or not they're going to be committed to the Word of God or rebellious against the Word of God or reject or try to eliminate or ignore the Word of God. So, the conviction that we have as you stand, I mean, learning about church history, you're learning about your history, the history of the faith of the Bible, the history of the faith in Christ, faith in Christ as it moves forward in the church, the family of God, the bride of Christ that is uh, here as his representative here on earth, this, this uh, new gathering of people who are a um, nation of priests and as we're described as in First Peter. So, we have a function, we have, a, have a, a direction, and that direction is given by the Word of God. And the question is, is what will you make of your time and your part in that little plan? Will you be among those who compromise and slide off, or will you be among those who continually seek to dedicate yourself to the clear and understanding of and explanation and, and uh, exploration of the Word of God? That is the great conviction that I hope you uh, are, are take away from this study in learning and seeing that the Bible, the Word of God, is God's major tool for shaping and encouraging our lives. The Holy Spirit works with the Word of God. Jesus Christ is revealed through the Word of God. God's will is revealed through the Word of God. And the question is, if you want to be on the, uh, the, the, a part of this um, movement, this church uh, movement going forward, then it is vital, it is critical, and that which will remain and that which will persist will be that which is given to and dedicated to the Lord and to His Word. So, Hopefully this has been an encouraging class for you. We just uh, remind you as you finish this final module, you'll be finishing the whole class. There's one chapter of reading in chapter 43. You've got this lecture to listen to. We'll have our discussion class as well as you'll turn in your three-page essay and there's a final assignment quiz that is longer than your previous or assessment quiz. There's longer than your previous assessment quizzes, but I'm confident that you'll be able to do well at it. It's a sort of taken from, you know, the information taken from previous lectures and hopefully uh, tried to hit the high points, the most important things for you to do. I just want to remind you again that three-page paper is a double-spaced highlight uh, a paper hi highlighting the important, some important doctrinal development or movement in the church uh, after the year 1500 AD. 
we'd like you to use scripture references as well as um, a second, three secondary sources. One of those can be your textbook. Um, they can be internet sources. Uh, they can be, again, theological resources. If you're, you're looking at a certain doctrine or movement, it's helpful to look at a commentary or something like that. But three secondary sources, uh, scripture references, and of course, the historical information. And with that, you have completed all of the lecture work for the, uh, the, the, the course at CBU of Church History 2. And may God richly bless you in all of your studies.